Uh, we're here with Peter Jones, uh, distinguished uh, engineer for Cisco and past uh, chair of the Enbase uh, T Alliance. Uh, know that uh, on the website we just published uh, an article from uh, Fluke's uh, Mark Mullins, where uh, he states that pretty much for new uh, buildings and stuff. Uh, they can't uh, recommend anything other than Cat 6A, um, but uh, meanwhile, there's still tons of Cat 6 and Cat 5E uh, everywhere that can. Uh, so, the alliance, so pushing in base T.3BZ, like two and a half gig, has been a big part of my life over the last uh, almost, I guess it's four and a half years. And as you mentioned, the alliance, which started off building contentious towards the standard and ecosystem. And we uh, we succeeded big time because we got a standard through in less than two years, um, and that that group has now sort of transitioned to its next stage. It's not so much that it's dead; it's just sort of it's gone. It's a bit like going from a, um, a caterpillar to a butterfly. That's probably not, not the right term. <laughs> so we've matured, and now we've sort of we've gone home into the Ethernet Alliance. So we've really folded back in. You know, we've developed we've developed effectively the market technology. Now it becomes part of the mainstream Ethernet story. So you know, the alliance started November 14-ish, and we're uh, we're officially merging in this month. So that's been a, it's been a very interesting journey. Yep, and we uh, we sure covered that uh, on on the website, and uh, it's uh, notable that all the Enbase T uh, resources, because I know that there were a bunch of good uh, white papers and webcasts, will now be uh, you know. They're getting ported over to uh, Ethernet Alliance. When, so, so let's be clear at the minute, I'm sort of speaking as the ex-head of the InBase T Alliance and a bit of the Ethernet Alliance person, but mostly as me. Um, so, you know, when Cisco started on this journey a very long time ago, we really started because we were looking forward to see, like, what we're going to do with access points when they go above the gig. At the time, this was pretty interesting because access points were sitting around 100 meg. But clearly... You know, the idea of saying we're going to go to 10G based T with 6A was not credible for a bunch of reasons. Firstly, there was not enough 6A out there in the world. You know, as you know, people don't, people don't upgrade cabling just to put in a new access point. But even with that, 10G based T wouldn't fit inside the power envelope for an access point. You know, access points can dissipate about 30 watts. And that includes everything. And so putting a, a 10G based T interface on that thing is sort of not viable. So, I mean, if you fast forward for a while, you know, we told, we told stories about what this needed to do. And, you know, as you may remember, the standards world has a habit of having, of having fights about things that matter to people inside the standards world, but not so much outside. Now, the example of this would be .11n, where there was two ways to do it. Or even if you go back to 100, to 100, to 100 meg Ethernet, there was base T and DGN LAN. And the vast bulk of our customers actually don't care if we deliver bits like carrier pigeon, but of course, to us, it's really important. And I think the reason why we were able to succeed was we focused on the story of value to the user, not on the story of what technology was. Because eventually, as I said, you know, we could deliver bits by carrier pigeon that our customers wouldn't care. So, you know, as we went through the story, we found, you know, we found, as you alluded to before, you know, when we started, we didn't really know what cabling infrastructure looked like. So we thought we had an idea. And then we did some collaborative work with, you know, a number of companies and we went to talk to Bizria. You're familiar with Bizria, I assume? Oh, yeah, yep. Oh, yeah. Um, the and, researcher. Yeah, and we talked to Lone, Lone Hansen, who's a lovely lady out of England. And so at that stage, we got back some data in 2014-ish, maybe 2015. And they basically, what they did is they looked at cable sales, you know, both worldwide and per region over the last, uh, it was like I think it was 10, 15 years. They then looked at you know replacement rates and average drops. So at that stage they came out with an estimate of the 1.4 billion outlets installed, 1.3 were 5B and 6. I mean the surprise at the time was it was quite that skewed, and also there was actually more 6 out there than 5B. So we recently did right. a MBC Alliance did a you know, webinar with Lone a little while ago, and we're still selling more 5B and 6 than we are 6A. No, so the, I mean, part of the story is the way I think about it is, you know, almost in almost all businesses, there's a, a low, a middle, a high product, right? You can normally tell people a little bit more than they need. For a long time, there was no belief that you need more than a gig. So, 
you mentioned earlier that uh, InBase T Alliance or even Fluke are recommending you can you should go 6A. So mm -hmm. we actually recently published a white paper, and part of it was to look at what what the current best practice cabling recommendations give you. Because there has mm -hmm. been some discussion from people to say access points are going to go really really fast, and so maybe we need to go for like a 25 gig solution. So we went through and we took a look, and this was the authors for this was people from Comscope and Panjo and Flick, we, and Mr. Zimmerman, of course, and we took a look at what you currently get. Now, if you, if you implement two six A's to every access point, which is the best recommendation, you get a couple of things. So clearly, you get up to 10 gig if you ever need it. The other thing that they normally recommend you do is that you would run the two cables, you run into a service loop, and maybe the service loop is three to five meters. So the two cables get you one big advantage, which is if one happens to go wrong, you just change the end devices. You change the endpoints, which is sort of cool. The other choice is you get a couple of choices. If you have to go fast in that access point, you could potentially go and get an access point which went around link aggregation, but maybe even more effectively, you go and put another access point in close to it. So it gives you a great future printing story. So yeah, if someone asked me what to put in today, I would say put in 6.8. And they'd say, but it's a bit more expensive. And I'd say, well, you could either save, you know, 5% now, or you could, you could be prepared to come back and rip your walls out later on, or you could be prepared just to say no a lot. So I don't yeah. want to come back in 20 years' time and have to deal with a large install base, you know, still install base of 5 and 6. I prefer that not to be the case. If you went the uh, the recommendation of 2 by 6 days for an access point, I could give you an access point. I could deliver 20 gig per second to that access point and 180 watts of power, or maybe 140. That's a very large access point. I mean, what do you guys think about, when you think about it, what do you think the, for a normal building, what do you see as the installed life of the cable plan expected? I mean, I sort of tend to think in the 20 to 25 year mark. I mean, it's hard to tell because one of the, thing they, one of the things they talk about with 5G is uh, the shorter range of the uh, millimeter uh, wave. You end up needing a higher density of devices. Yeah. That being said, um, it's going to be interesting. So this really depends on how you've structured your building. Um, I mean, if you've done, if you've done, you know, open trays and things, it's a little easier to add a few more in. It's easier to add a couple more in than it is to like go change them. So I could imagine as people start to roll it out, they're going to start to add devices. I think that's much easier than a wholesale change. So if if you ignore that for the time being, uh, I, I would think that you're the copper infrastructure in a building is, is expected to last at least 15 years plus, more like 20, which in my head is an enormous asset. Right? That's not a cost, that's an asset for your company. Well, right. I mean, you know, that's that's really it with uh, with copper. It can, uh, I guess it can get uh, organizations there, uh, you know, faster with with uh, what they already have. So, uh, which, which to me is that that's going that's increasing the return on investment of your of your asset. And I think for a lot too long we've we've viewed that stuff as like a cost, and it's like no, it's stop. You know, if you think if you think the network is a cost and you know cabling is part of the network, I can solve that for you. You know, I, I can make your TCO zero. I'm going to turn the entire network off and sell it all. And it's like, oh, now your now your now your now your company can't work. All right, fine. That stuff has value. You know, I mean, not to you know, go all 5G on you, but I mean, you know, if I were to ask you to uh, sort of uh, connect the dots between uh, N-Base T and 5G, I mean, can you do that? Now, effectively, when I look at it, um, sort of 5G and 11AX slash 556 have the same set of problems. They're promising a lot of bandwidth. Um, density needs to be pretty high. And, uh, clearly, if you're in the public domain, you're, you're, you're looking mostly at 5G. But if you think about it today, even with stadiums, people offload that you know, they offload mobile data onto Wi-Fi. So I think you could think about this in general as, as who owns it. So my guess is if you're running to go or 5G inside an enterprise building, you probably outsource that to a carrier. Yeah. If you are staying with yourself, right, I would expect people, most people to go to 11AX. Now, that being said, you're gonna see um, the predictions. Uh, we, we did another, MST Alliance did another uh, webinar with Deloro. You know, they, were, they were predicting that the bulk of 11x access points will ship with a two and a half gig interface. 
And so that's where they were projecting two and a half and five gig as being like the fastest growing part of the market. So right. the answer is sure. As as things crank up, you're gonna you're gonna see devices go faster, right? If you can run those things over install cabling, that's an that's an awesome value proposition. Before we move on, yep. one other thing about that is just ignore ignore the cost of recabling for a second. Okay. So imagine the difference between you know, because as you know, we have the IT guys and the building guys, right? And they, they, they don't work on the same cycles. They're not connected. So let's say you got this thing that says, awesome, I've got this new upgrade, right? I, you know, I want to, want to deploy Wi-Fi 6. Oh, to make use of this, I have to go and recable. Oh, so that means I need to shift everyone out of the building for three months. You know, that's, a, that's a huge disruption, even in growing costs. However, if you can use your installed infrastructure, it's a much more incremental, simple change to make. Right? I can make that change across the weekend. So I think in base T just makes it much easier to adopt the new technology. Yeah. I mean, it's mostly Cat6 out there. That's what, the Mark Mullen, that's what Mark Mullins uh, says in, in the article. But when I was thinking about it, because, you know, you may or may not remember, but this is 2014, having industry in general was on a big push to get people to install 6A. And there was I coming and saying, look, you don't really need 6A now. You can do it with what you have. So that was a bit of a challenge for those people. It's like, hang on a second, right? You're just changing the story around. And I think what I ended up with was if instead of looking at, you know, when you sell, you want the first sale, but you want all the rest of them as well. Yes, yeah, someone may only replace, update one building every 25 years, but most people build new buildings. So I think the story I got down to was if you treat that as a major asset, and if you do your job properly, when they come to upgrade, it's going to work really nicely, and then you're going to get the next building. So I think that became, you know, in almost all businesses, your goal is to keep your customers. So if you can deliver, if you sell them something, and they, you get deliver more value on that, next time you come back, it's a really easy sale. So that trend, you know, the, the move from I sell a bit of cable to I deliver an asset, I think was the key thing that made it easier for your for your industry to understand it also meant that you would be rewarding good workmanship you know, if someone put in the, the bad cable and done a bad job that would be bad but if someone had done good workmanship then it was going to deliver you more value than you sold you know and that's a great value proposition 